All right, so uh, thank you everyone for coming out. It's really nice to see so many people. Uh, my name is Mark Tarrant, I'm the Postgraduate Officer on the SRC. And uh, tonight we're joined by Dr. Richard Dennis of the Australian Institute, and we're very excited about that. Uh, we're gonna, uh, but before, before that, I'd like to just acknowledge that we are meeting on the uh, traditional lands of the Ghana people. Uh, sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land, and uh, we should all just be aware of that. Um, so yeah, I think tonight it's going to be a sort of a free-form discussion, uh, sort of hosted here by Tom Gilchrist, the president of the Adelaide University Student Representative Council. Um, we'll talk about things like the budget, the double disillusion election, and uh, maybe the nuclear fuel cycle kind of stuff, maybe the exploration of the Great Australian Bike for Oil, but uh, <coughs> maybe we'll leave it up to them. Uh, talk for about half an hour and then have some questions at the end. Cool. All right. Thank you. Oh, well, I think a good place to start would be probably the budget. Um, you know, it's come out a little last week, so I don't know if mine. Yep. So, you know, something you'd like to pick up from there? To... Yeah, look, I mean, it's really interesting. I'm an economist, so apologies for that. Uh, and I'm from Canberra, so it's worse. Um, but the budget is kind of this thing that most people kind of know about but don't care about. Or if they care about it, it's through the kind of tables that you'll see in the newspaper. What does it mean for me? You know, family with two kids who earn less than 75 grand, family with two kids who earn more than 75 grand. Um, but here's what a budget is. A budget is a request from the government to parliament. It's actually a bill. It's a bill before parliament that spells out everything they want to spend money on for the next 12 months. And it actually, in to the decimal place spells out effectively what the government of the day's priorities are. So when politicians say my priority is this or my priority is that, they're usually bullshitting. But the budget makes it really clear which things they've prioritised, literally prioritised, as in put more resources into. So unfortunately, you know, as, as uh, Scott Morrison would want you to believe, it's not a budget, it's a 10 year plan. It's a 10 year plan. No winners or losers. There's no winners or losers. Let's not get caught up in that whole thing where the Herald tells you or the Tizer tells you that you lost. Don't worry. It's a plan. Well, the one thing you should ignore about the budget is the plan. Because the budget kind of, and has for many years, has what we call four year projections, four, four years of forward estimates. That's right, I'd be angry about it too. <laughs> and what we know from the four year projections is that they're complete rubbish. Absolutely spectacularly wrong. So, Peter Costello, remember the GFC, 2008, 2007, 2008, let's say 2008. The budget papers in 2005 didn't predict them, the budget papers in 2006 didn't predict them, so the budget papers in 2007 didn't predict them. Because we have no idea what's going to happen. No idea. Can't tell you what interest <coughs> rates will be in three months' time. Can't tell you what oil prices will be in three months' time. Poor people at Santos can't tell you what oil prices will be in three months' time. We have no idea. None. Yet, we kind of pretend, don't worry about the fact that I increased, uh, I cut taxes for rich people, don't worry about that. Don't worry about the fact that I cut spending for women re-entering the workforce, don't worry about that. Look at my 10 year plan. The one thing I can tell you about the budget is that 10 year plan is irrelevant. Just because no one knows what's going to happen in four years time, we'll learn 10. Yet the one thing that we do know with crystal clear, clar crystal clear clarity is uh, who got more money and who got less and the government would ask you to not worry about that. <laughs> so, yeah, look, you know, the budget is not a budget, it's a plan. That's because they don't want you to think about the budget. Yeah. Well, like you said, you know, a budget says pretty clearly uh, what are and are the priorities of, you know, the government of the day. You know, in your opinion, what are the priorities of the government today? Well, again, the budget papers mean I don't have to speculate. I can tell you. Yeah. Like I, I know what their priorities are. Um, you know, and God bless you here in Adelaide. We're going to spend $50 billion to build 12 new subs to replace the six we haven't used yet. Yeah. Now, the argument is, the argument is that this is the only way to create jobs for Adelaide. Yeah, that or like teachers or nurses or a car industry. 
Public transport. Public transport. Every three weeks. Renewable energy. Crazy talk. Right. See, the point is that we've just accepted that, oh, if there's 50 billion going, that has to be for defence. And if it's a choice for Adelaide between 50 billion for subs or nothing, oh, well, thanks, I'll take the subs. But who invented that choice? Where did that choice come from? Not, and by the way, 12 subs, not 13 or 11 or 10, 12. Where did that number come from? Ah, oh, it's twice as many as six. <laughs> Which is proof that we have a lot more than we used to. <laughs> You're laughing that this is true. And what's the rationale? Ah, oh, well, they might come in handy one day in the next 50 years. Maybe a bit. Why can't we afford to tackle climate change? Oh, well, there's no certainty. Well, we can't be certain about climate change, even though 99% of the world science say I'd be scared if I were you. So we're allowed to blow 50 billion on a could come in handy. By the way, defence is the precautionary principle. Has anyone heard of the precautionary principle? Right, Greenies didn't invent it, defence did. <laughs> no, they did. Oh, that's the rationale. Like, we spend hundreds of billions of dollars in pace. But when it comes to climate change, oh, you wouldn't want to rush into doing that. Might waste our dough. What, like the Joint Strike Fighter? <laughs> so what are the priorities? The priorities are defence spending. Will that create some jobs in Adelaide? Yep. Would spending $50 billion on anything create some jobs in Adelaide? Yep. <laughs> right, you can actually separate the two. And we watched the car industry die because we didn't want it. Uh, tax cuts. Um, the top one, so the tax cuts in the budget, the top 1% of income earners will get 48% of the benefits. People earning 250000 bucks a year will be $12,000 a year better off. That's one of the priorities. Uh, tax cuts for people earning over $80,000, um, that's the top 25% of the population. Um, they were the priorities. You know, it seems like a pattern here in South Australia about uh, governments wanting to do unsavoury things um, in order to create jobs. And, you know, it strikes me there's plenty of things like, you know, renewables and things that would also create jobs. But uh, we've just had here in South Australia, obviously, nuclear um, has come up as a question. Um, and, you know, this week, the publications of the Royal Commission um, into the nuclear fuel cycle. I wondered if you want to... Yeah, comment on the sort of arguments that are in that. Yeah, um, the depths of biocynicism knows no bounds. So <laughs> uh, if, if some of what I say seems a little bit cynical, it's not. It's because you're not listening hard enough. <laughs> it's meant to be a lot cynical. <laughs> so hear me carefully. Um, we need unemployment. We need unemployment. It helps us as a society get people to do things they don't want to do. Do you hear me? We need unemployment. We create unemployment. Because having unemployment allows us to say to people, would you like a choice between a nuclear waste dump or your kids to be unemployed? Okay? Because if no one was worried about their kids being unemployed, no one would choose a nuclear waste dump. So whenever you wind up in what you feel like is some impossible choice, like, ah, oh, it's a really tough dilemma, do I hate children or want a nuclear waste dump? <laughs> understand, that, understand that someone who is much better at politics than you has <coughs> created that choice for you, knowing which way you'll jump. And when I say knowing, I mean knowing. That's what the polling's about. But knowing which way you'll jump when they create these terrible choices for you. So South Australians believe that because they want their kids to have jobs, we should spend 50 billion on subs. And South Australians believe that because they want their kids to have jobs, you should have a nuclear waste dump. And you know, if I lived down here and was worried about unemployment, I might make those choices too. But the bullshit choices have been invented to make you feel bad. They've been invented to split environmentalists who might care about kids and working class people who aren't environmentalists and care about kids 
who might be able to agree that a carbon tax and a renewable energy might solve more of their problems simultaneously, what if someone was so good at politics that they could actually split two groups who might otherwise agree with each other and, and, and get support for something that no one really wants? I mean, here's how to reframe, I can talk about the economics, but if you want to reframe the whole nuclear debate, just ask people, do you want your kid to work at a nuclear waste dump? But does anyone actually aspire to work at a nuclear waste dump? Is anyone hoping that their kid will go and get a job at a nuclear waste dump? Now that's your plan? <laughs> it's kind of pathetic. But faced with, well, so you just hate children and want them all to be unemployed, do you? You can sell it. <coughs> Did I mention I'm a little cynical? <laughs> Well, would you like to comment a little bit on some of the economic arguments in there? Because, yeah, it seems to be a lot that that was the way it was framed. Yeah. Um, it's come up with an answer that they like. Um, but, you know, yeah, you should be cynical about that too. Yeah, you certainly should. It's complete rubbish. Um, uh, so at the beginning of this debate, Adelaide was told, South Australia was told, um, we've got this plan. We're going to uh, invent fourth generation nuclear reactors, because I've got faith in South Australia, we can do it. I'm sure no one else has invented them, but oh, we can here. Yeah. We're going to, in I'm not kidding, this is the story, we're going to invent these things that no one else in the world has, because I've got faith in South Australians. And these, these new fourth generation reactors are so cool, that what they're going to do is they're going to take other people's nuclear waste and burn them as fuel. How good is that? And it gets better. Because not only will people pay us to take the waste <coughs> off them and we'll get rich, we can then take their waste and burn it in our new power station that no one else has invented and get rich. And then you'll all have free electricity. Do you remember the front page of the title? <laughs> I'm not making this up. You'll all have free electricity and we'll all be so rich, so rich, that we can actually scrap stamp duty and payroll tax because we're just going to be so rich. Once the world pays us to take their waste, idiots, and then we burn them in this thing that only we invented, idiots. <laughs> this was Senator Sean Edwards' plan. This was run prominently. The enormous economic benefits for the nuclear fuel cycle. Remember when it was a cycle? It was not a cycle anymore turned out the fourth generation nuclear power stations don't exist because no one in the world knows how to build them and the cycle is no longer a cycle it's a dump and the rest of the world is going to sell you a lot of nuclear waste and you're going to store it and they're going to pay you a fortune for it so you can still get rich Sure, we were going to burn it and make free electricity, but we've dropped that bit off. Now you're just going to get paid an enormous <coughs> amount of money to store stuff that no one else in the world wants. But don't worry, they're idiots. Right? It's going to be safe and fun and profitable. And it's going to be so profitable in part because the Royal Commission has now said those fourth generation reactors don't exist and can't be built. So don't worry, no one's going to invent one and steal our market off us. We're going to corner the market in nuclear waste. No one else in the world will want to buy the nuclear waste. Not the people and Chernobyl who are building a nuclear waste dump at the moment. And you know the advantage of having a nuclear waste dump in Chernobyl? Sorry. It is a nuclear waste dump. It's horrible. <laughs> Right, it's horrible what we did to Chernobyl. But it's a pretty good place to have a nuclear waste dump. So the economics of the genius plan that you're going to get so rich taking other people's waste off them assumes that the rest of the world that's never exported nuclear waste to anyone is going to export it to South Australia and pay $1.7 million a tonne for it, which is a price that one consultant invented. Right? and you're going to corner the market, and you're going to make a fortune out of it. And you know what happens in industries when someone makes a fortune selling a product, like a smartphone or a tablet? What happens in other industries when someone makes a fortune selling something? Competition. Competition. Don't worry, there won't be any. 
Right? No one else is going to be as dumb as you. <laughs> Except the people in Chernobyl who are already doing it, but let's not worry so much about that. So, um, so the economics don't make any sense. The, the world is never, there is no world market for the nuclear waste. We can't predict the oil price in three months' time. These people have predicted the price of nuclear waste for the next hundred years. Right? We can't predict the exchange rate next week. They can predict the Australian dollar nuclear waste price for 100 years. I think they're full of crap. Right? They might be perfectly right, but this is a very, very risky thing to do. And one last thing, sorry, that's a long answer, but the nuclear waste in the model put forward by the Royal Commission, I'm just choosing my words very carefully here, this is what is going to happen, this is the business case for the dump. High level nuclear waste will be stored above ground. Did you hear me? Above ground for a hundred years. This is the business case. Basically, the business case is if we could get paid for a hundred years to take nuclear waste and not bury it underground, <coughs> imagine how much money we would get getting paid a lot to not do something. And then when we've stockpiled this enormous amount of cash for not storing it safely underground, we'll be able to afford to store it underground. And this is in the Royal Commissioner's report. And when I said this in Adelaide a month ago, the Royal Commissioner said I was wrong. Well, I wasn't wrong, and his final report proves it. His final report still says that nuclear waste will high-level nuclear waste, the kind of stuff terrorists like, will be stored above ground in South Australia for 100 years. That's what makes the project viable. Because you get paid to do expensive storage, and you don't do expensive storage for 100 years. It's a good idea. <coughs> <laughs> On balance. Yeah. Well, when we are, I guess, confronted with a report that says to do this and business interests and then a, a Premier telling us to be... Sorry, a Premier telling us to be open-minded, yep. um, we have these reports, where do we go from here, you know, how do we take this on? Look, that's up to you guys to some extent, but, you know, I, I'd, I'd be asking if... I, so, I hate to say it, the reason that economists perform a really important role in democracy, we make the simple incomprehensible, okay? It's our job to make simple stuff seem hard or impossible or impenetrable. We, economists do not run anything. We don't run the country. Don't ever fall for the idea that economists run anything. We are the cover story. We are the witch doctors. We help politicians explain the inexplicable or avoid the simple. So, it's true, all right? Martin Turnbull's not an economist. Peter Costello wasn't an economist. Tony Abbott wasn't an economist. I don't think we've ever had an economist as prime minister. Economists don't do, we don't run anything. So the thing you don't want to do is wind up being responsible for explaining stuff. Explaining stuff is hard and scary. What you want to be is the people asking stuff. So you just need to ask, is it true that in if we start importing nuclear waste that some of it will still be stored above ground in 100 years' time? Just ask that question every time you get a chance. Sorry, I'm just confused about something. Is it true that in 2100, there'll be high-level nuclear waste still being stored above ground in South Australia? Because the answer is yes, or they're lying. All right? It's true. Um, how will South Australia get rich from it? All the imaginary profits of this. Do you know who usually gets the profits of a project? people who own it. So South Australia's got two options. You, the taxpayer, can own it, spend all the money up front, take all the risk. If you guys spend all the money and take all the risk, you might make some profit. But if you don't spend all the money and take all the risk, you're not getting a cent. If you don't own it, it's not yours. So just keep asking people who owns it, who bears the risk. What happens if halfway through this thing goes belly up? Would we be left with the waste and some company went broke? Because companies never go broke, do they? <laughs> right, so 
So yeah, what do you do? You just gotta start asking lots of simple questions on a regular basis, including who wants to work at it? You know, again, the questions you are asked are the most political bit of all. And the question isn't, you're not being, the, the Premier isn't consulting the South Australian population to say, of all the jobs we could try and create for your kids, which ones do you want? That'd be an interesting consultation. You're not being asked that. You're being asked, do you want high unemployment or a nuclear waste dump? So keep asking, is this really the jobs that we want? Is this really the plan for South Australia? And if the answer is yes, I just won't visit so much. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, uh, something else that um, Mile mentioned in his uh, introduction, yeah. rather, is the Great Australian by expansion sort of around there. Is there something you'd like to comment around that? Other great things I we're love doing? love all the Dorothy Dixon's here. Yeah, he's, really, he's really getting stuck into me tonight, isn't he? Um, look, yeah, look, same story, all right? So the, the gas industry, the oil and gas industry, that giant, powerful thing, the oil and gas mm -hmm. industry, employs 0.2% of Australians. Right, 99.8% of Australians don't work in oil and gas. 0.4% of Australians work in coal. Right, oil and coal combined employ 0.6 of the population. That'd be 99.4% of people not working in oil and coal. And yet we tell ourselves these fairy tale stories about how they're the bedrock of the economy, they're the foundation of the budget, they're the they're the, they're the thing that creates jobs for everybody. It's just not true. Now, not being true is never really an impediment for politicians, but if you're actually trying to plan for where South Australia is going to be in 10, 20 or 30 years' time, then kind of truth will come into it. And the, this, this sort of cargo cult, and look, you know, South Australians aren't unique in falling for this, or... or all states in Australia have some element of it, Tasmanians, forests, Queensland and coal, um, Canberra and privatising. Um, uh, you know, all states have this kind of cargo cult that there's this simple thing that we can do and that'll make us strong again, that'll make us rich again. If only we kind of genuflect towards a powerful enough industry, they'll, they'll make us all safe and happy again. Um, and that's what's happening with Dubai. So has anyone heard of BP? Oh, yes. Yeah, right, so they've never had an accident. Have they? <laughs> right, so the people that have never had an accident want to drill for oil in the Great Australian Bight. There might be some risks. And those risks would be on you. But when they sell the oil, because whether you like it or not, I know you were never a penal colony, but um, I know that's very important to you, uh, but you are part of the Commonwealth of Australia. You know who gets the money when oil gets dug up and sold? The Commonwealth. <laughs> you don't get the royalties from oil. <laughs> Let me just spell this out for you. You don't get them. They come to me in Canberra. <laughs> you get all of the risk, you don't get royalties from oil. This is not top secret. It doesn't employ many people. It won't pay royalties to your state government. It's risky. <laughs> it's quite a sales pitch, isn't it? <laughs> but again, if people are scared enough, you can f turn that question, well, what do you think we should do then? What's your answer? If it's not oil and gas, what is it then? I don't know. Stop <coughs> sacking all the teachers and nurses? <laughs> you know, stop cutting the renewable energy target? Stop giving tax cuts to rich people? It's crazy stuff like that. How much does that um, make me think then, like, need to be doing more around actually putting forward a positive argument for what we can be spending money on instead of just, you know, opposing these projects? Actually, yeah, talk about things like, you know, what projects we should be building, you know. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And look, don't be too hard on yourself. I think the, the campaign around Port Augusta has been, anyone here involved in that? That's a fantastic campaign, you know, and, and it forced a whole bunch of people in, in government at various levels uh, and the population to kind of admit, yeah, that's a choice that we could make. Sorry, I don't want to do it, 
but, <laughs> but you know, don't pretend that there weren't alternatives available. And bizarrely, of course, because you know we know that renewables will never work and that sun doesn't shine. You know, why don't we go and do underground coal gasification? Because you know, like fourth generation reactors, we'll get the hang of it. We'll figure it out when we go along. Sure, there's been some BP esque mistakes when other people did it. I've got faith in South Australians. I know we can meet these challenges. So, you know, we we do actually. We have to call bullshit on this stuff. But the arguments that are used to say why we can't spend money on renewables, those arguments are never used for why we can't do nukes, or why we can't do underground coal gasification, or we can't do uh, you know, offshore drilling. You know, We're allowed to subsidise those things. We're allowed to take risks with those things. We're allowed to have uncertainty with those things. But renewables, oh no, it's got to be it's got to pay for itself on day one with no risk. You know, it's not hard, but again, economists are employed to make it seem hard. That's our job, make it seem hard. I'm just a whistleblower. Are we allowed to ask questions at this point? Yeah, well, I think it would be a yeah, good time to maybe yeah. open it up to the floor for some, you know, for oh, the I like your questions. questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I might have some more later, but <laughs> if you'd like to ask yeah. a question. Last yeah. year, the intergenerational report Yeah, um, complete rubbish, uh, absolute waste of everybody's time and money, uh, very expensive taxpayer funded document designed to scare you. That's the purpose of the intergenerational report. Did I, did I mention that we can't forecast interest rates in three months time? What's the time horizon for the intergenerational report? 50 years. All right, so let's go back. Let's imagine that we're living in uh, 1966 and we're doing the intergenerational report in Australia. How many people would the internet industry employ in our 1966 intergenerational report? Serious question. None. How about mobile phones? None. Air travel? Tiny little industry, never take off, pretty expensive. <laughs> right, it just doesn't even, like, nonsense doesn't come close to explaining the fundamental idiocy of trying to say, oh, some economists who work at Treasury have had a red hot go <coughs> at saying what the economy will look like in 50 years' time and some of it's a bit scary, so we have to cut welfare spending this year. That's the purpose of the intergenerational report. Oh, if unless we cut welfare spending and health spending this year, we'll be broke in 50 years' time. Oh, 50 years' time, that's a long way away. Do you think maybe we should worry about climate change? No. Nah. So, you know, again, no one, I'm choosing my words carefully, no one has the capacity to tell you anything interesting about what the economy will look like in 20, 50 years' time. Yet the budget papers with crystal clear clarity, and I said at that time, um, tell you exactly what the government's spending more money on this year or less money on next year. But the beautiful thing about the 10-year plan and the 50-year plan is it actually hides the plan which is revealed in its full horror in the annual budget papers. So, yeah, the intergenerational report, you know, says we need more population. There's no economic case for that. Uh, it says we need to cut taxes. Uh, it's no economic case for that. It says we need to spend less on health and education. There's no economic case for that. But strangely, cutting taxes, cutting government spending and rapid population growth are the kind of things that neoliberal governments love to do. Oh, and look, the intergenerational report <laughs> says we have to do it. I've um, got a question down the front here. Yeah, so Richard, um, I have a question about Greece, which is maybe a little bit off topic, but one of the things that we often get told is that what happened in Greece was because they spent too much money on welfare and, and people weren't paying enough taxes. Can you, like, in, you know, a 
Yeah. What about Greece? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Greece is a nice place. Uh, and look, the, the, you've got to be careful here because, you know, there's no doubt that some Greek politicians made some dumb decisions. So it's not was everything that happened in Greece good or evil. Um, but basically, uh, what happened with Greece, and this is complicated, but Greece and most European countries joined the European Union. And when they joined the European Union, they, they gave up having their own currency, the drachma, and they made a whole bunch of promises to the rest of Europe about how they'd manage their budget. You know, there were pros and cons of that, but that's what they did. But usually when an economy is not doing so well, and they, they're importing, for example, a lot more than they're exporting, their exchange rate would fall. And when your exchange rate falls, then exports get dearer. All right? Oh, sorry, I imports get dearer. So if you're a Greek living in Greece pre-Euro and the drachma collapses, then a BMW gets more expensive, so you don't buy one. And as the drachma collapses, a whole bunch of Germans say, oh, Greece looks like a cheap place to go for a holiday. I might go there. So when the exchange rate moves around, it actually helps an economy adjust. Well, when Greece moved into the Euro, they threw that away. And what happens, so the euro, the exchange rate for the euro is the same in Germany, it's the same in, uh, it's the same in Italy, it's the same in France, it's the same in Greece. So in a rich country like Australia, we have parts of Australia like Tasmania that are actually broke. And you guys aren't far above it, to be honest. Oh, well, let's be clear. And that's fine. We're all one big country, and I, as a, uh, I, as a Canberran, um, don't get as much federal government money per person as a Tasmanian or Northern Territory or South Australian, because we're in the Commonwealth of Australia. And we've signed up for that. Well, Greece is in the Commonwealth of Europe, where it gets stuck with the European exchange rate, but it doesn't have any of those transfers. So in Australia, when Northern Territory incomes fall way behind the rest of Australia, the Northern Territory exchange rate doesn't fall, but we just post them a bigger check. Um, so the Greeks kind of got the raw end of the pineapple, to mix my metaphor, the rough end of the pineapple. Um, because, yeah, with, with no exchange rate to adjust, they had no real capacity and, and promises about what they'll do with their budget deficit. They had no real capacity to solve some of the problems. So, uh, yeah, it's, that's a long answer to your question, but what does it mean for Australia? Nothing. It means nothing for Australia. Um, we aren't like Greece in almost any sense. We're not part of a currency union with other countries, for example. Uh, we have very low levels of debt. Did you hear that? Low levels of debt very low levels of debt. We have very low levels of tax by rich country standards. We're a low tax, low debt, rich country. We have nothing in our economy that in any meaningful way says we'll be like Greece, except stupid reports like an intergenerational report, which literally projects straight lines for 50 years, and say if nothing changed in 50 years, we might have a problem. Yeah, go on with that. But when does nothing change for 50 years? So we're low debt, we're low tax, we're one of the richest countries in the world living at the richest point in world history. We don't have Greece's problems. Um, take the gentleman there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, welcome to Adelaide. Thank you. Yeah. You talked about the cargo <coughs> cult, and associated with the cargo cult is the trickle down effect. <laughs> <laughs> How are we going to smash people's hope about the trickle down effect? Oh, that's easy. No one believes it. Oh, I don't know that's true. Oh, no, I don't, I don't think in their hearts people believe it. Um, let's be clear. So the trickle-down effect is... By the way, for, so the trickle-down effect was, uh, you know, famously uh, experimented on by Ronald Reagan, to a lesser extent Margaret Thatcher, um, an American economist, Laffer, uh, sounds like Laffer, invented the Laffer curve, and the Laffer curve, anyone here ever seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off? 
Right, so trickle down economics is made famous in Ferris Bueller's day. It was being mocked in the mid 80s. Right, in the mid 80s, in Ferris Bueller's day, oh. Ferris is wagging school, his friends are all stuck in class, and the world's most boring economics lecturer was talking about the lack of good. Does anyone remember what it was called? Voodoo economics. Voodoo economics. You know who gave it the name voodoo economics? George Bush. George Bush Sr. Lefty. <laughs> said, this is crazy. George Bush Sr., former head of the CIA, US president, declared war on everyone, described trickle-down economics as voodoo economics. It's never, ever worked. And most people, I think, uh, understand the idea that the best way to help the poor is to help the rich first. <laughs> See, you're laughing now. A minute ago, you thought we could win this fight. Um, right? It really doesn't pass the laugh test. So, uh, in Australia, we've kind of Turnbull flirted with this new language. We briefly pretended it wasn't trickle-down economics. We said. We needed to cut taxes for either rich people or businesses because that would generate a growth dividend. Does anyone remember the growth dividend? That's just trickle down economics. It's a bank account growth dividend for the rich. Exactly. So, you know, let's be clear uh, there's no economic evidence that it works. Economic history tells us it doesn't. Reagan delivered the biggest budget deficits America's ever seen. Right? Voodoo economics didn't work. Except if you thought cutting taxes was an end in itself. So remember, I said. So, so, yeah. Could we throw in an Orson Sparrow theory just for everybody's amusement? Uh, which? Orson Sparrow. I don't know the Orson Sparrow theory. Oh, um, pre 1929, Orson Sparrow was a. Uh, oh, Orson Sparrow. Orson Sparrow. Orson, yeah. okay. So I know I look old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> So a horse, uh, basically a horse runs along, you feed it enough, it takes a shit, the sparrow can eat what's left out of the droppings. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. No, sorry, I, I do know that. Yes, we all uh, we all benefit from eating the shit of the rich. Yes. <laughs> um, sorry, I, did, I have I heard of that metaphor. Um, yeah, exactly. It doesn't really kind of sound like something you win and fight within the democracy, except you get when people are terrified. When people are scared enough of unemployment, when you say this is the only chance you've got, you can get people to make bad choices. So, so let me kind of let me kind of put it to you this way with, with the whole uh, with the whole kind of trickle down thing. Trickle down economics is a nice theoretical idea that never worked anywhere ever. But the people pushing it aren't stupid. Might seem stupid, but they're actually running the show. So why would they be doing something that they know doesn't work? It might be because they're lying about their objective. Right? It might just be that they're pretending to want to help poor people. Now remember I said before I was a bit cynical? <laughs> it gets better. Nothing conservatives like Thatcher, Reagan, Abbott or Turnbull, nothing they love more than a budget deficit. They love budget deficits. Budget deficits are central to their political strategy. Because when you have a budget deficit, oh, a deficit, <coughs> what do you have to do? Cut. What do you have to cut? <coughs> On poor people. Yeah. So they're not even beginning of cynical yet. So if you love budget deficits, because they give you a great political hammer to smash the things you wanted to smash. What's the best way to cause a big budget deficit? Spend all the money in good times on long-term tax cuts and spend Tax it. cuts. And weapons. <laughs> well, weapons, exactly. Right, so you, so here's the thing. Here's, I, in, in America, they call this strategy starving the beast. No, Google it. I'm not making this up. The Americans call it starving the beast. What is the beast? the public sector. Do I call it the right wing ratchet? When the economy is going well, cut taxes for rich people. Say it'll be good for the economy. Cut taxes when things are going well. When things go badly, 
don't have enough revenue, what do you wind up with? A budget deficit. Oh no, we've got a budget deficit. I should increase taxes again. No, I should. That's stupid. I should cut spending. People like spending on health. They like spending on education. They like spending on welfare. It pulls its head off. It does. It pulls its head off. But we give people a false choice. Do you want to run the economy into the ground and wind up like Greece? Or do we cut spending on things we like? And to create that dilemma, first you have to cause a budget deficit. And you do that by cutting taxes when things are going really well. So we all know that Labor introduced expensive policies like the NDIS, you know, and they weren't fully costed, and now the budget's in ruin because they gave us the NDIS. Sorry, did Peter Costello fully cost his tax cuts? No, that's not the point, Richard. When Costello cut taxes in 2007 with all rosy future and no GFC, was that irresponsible? That's not the point, Richard. We're not talking about Costello's tax cuts. That's not the point. The point is the Labor Party spent too much money and now we have to cut spending. It wouldn't work on smart people, would it? You're not cynical enough. Well, it strikes me though we've had 30 years of people actually, I think, the polling supporting more spending on health than education while they do. both parties moving you know, further away from that. That's, this is my point. Like Spending money on health, education, public transport, renewable energy pulls its head off. The only way to make people not want to do it is to create a false choice that you'll run us into the muck like Greece if we don't do it. All right, so this whole kind of, there's a whole psychology behind this. There's a great book by an American woman, Anak Shankar Osario, you won't remember that, but it's a great title. The book's called Don't Buy It, which is really funny, isn't it? Because she wants you to buy it. <laughs> anyway, she's a cognitive linguist. I'm not, I'm an economist. She's a cognitive linguist. Talks about how the brain responds to words. Right? Because your brain responds to words. Whether you like it or not, your brain responds. And in, in, in a comment babble, I kind of do a little bit of cognitive <laughs> linguistics, I can barely remember what it's called. Um, the word deficit is a bad word. It's a bad word. And you can't help that your brain thinks deficit's a bad word. So when I say budget deficit, your brain is bad thing. You can't help that. So when I say someone died of a heroin surplus, <laughs> you get confused. Because surplus is a good word. Right? Your brain, sorry, not yours, the person sitting next to your brain, you're smarter than them. Your brain, or their brain, can't help but think died of a heroin surplus is, I've got cognitive dissonance. You can't die of a good thing. Because your brain thinks a surplus is good and a deficit is bad. And a budget deficit isn't bad, it's just a thing. It's not bad. It's not good either. It's just a thing. But your brain can't help thinking it's a bad thing. So they have they give you a choice between do you want more money for health and education or a bad thing? And you can't help but feel bad when they talk about bad thing. The person sitting next to you can't. Good question. Hopefully this is a quick question. Um, I, I won't give you a quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question's about military spending. I remember hearing on Radio National, which I have on all the time, because it's so yes, fascinating, <laughs> on background briefing, that apparently there is an agreement, a historic agreement amongst a group of countries to spend a certain percentage of their GDP on military. Yep. Do you know anything about this? Can you shed any light on it? Look, I, I don't know about the specific agreement between specific countries, but I do know that Australia says bizarre things like we want to spend 2% of GDP on yeah, defence. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah, yeah, and it's, so it's not uncommon, but so why? What do you mean? You want to spend... Because we signed up for something. No, no, I get it, but, it's, but break it down. Like, why would you want to spend a percent? Yeah. That's kind of weird. Like, I can understand why you think you need X number of tanks. But if the economy grows a bit faster than expected, why do we need an extra tank? <laughs> now think about it, like percentages aren't things. 
just in case. <laughs> well, even more just in case. And, and saying you want to spend 2% of, of GDP on defence doesn't even make sense because that means if the economy slows down, we need less tanks. Well, sorry, how many tanks do we fucking need? Because it's not a variable. <laughs> uh, the right amount of tanks sounds like the right amount of tanks. And it doesn't seem related to whether GDP grew at 3.5 or 2.9% this year. So the fact that we actually stipulate our defence spending, we, we kind of define it as a percentage of GDP, <coughs> is like you saying, I'm going to spend 10% of my income on food, and if I get a pay rise, then I'll just automatically eat more. <laughs> so, now, the person sitting next to you looks like maybe that's what they've done, but you know, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to define defence spending. If your objective was to secure our nation, it doesn't make any sense to define it as a percentage of GDP. But if the purpose of defence spending was to prove that you're part of a foreign policy club, yeah. which I think is what you're getting at, then your, your foreign policy club, you, you make, you know, we kind of genuflect towards the US and promise to buy a given amount of kit from them. It doesn't matter if we need it. That's not the point. We're posting money to our powerful ally. What we're really buying is if we buy enough tanks off them, we hope they'll come and use their tanks one day. And the price is our defence spending. So I don't think we should spend zero on defence, by the way. I'm just saying the way we talk about it is unrelated to the version of politics or version of economics that you're usually asked to swallow. Hence the 12 subs. Exactly. And, and, and the significance of which country you know, that, you know, think about Abbott. Oh, we have to buy them from Japan. Why? Well, I want to suck up to them. I want to show that Australia, Japan and the US are in a club. And I want a $50 billion commitment to the payment of membership dues. Which is fine, we can do that, but let's be clear, that's not about subs. It's about being in the club. Maybe we should ask, look, if we, if we cut the subs out, can we join the club for $5 billion? Or I'll pop it to 45. <laughs> no, seriously, it's only the profit margin that matters. I wish you could pay them $5 billion. Not have the subs. If we don't really need the subs, we just want to be in the club, let's ditch the subs. Pay the membership dues. Would be regionally competitive, though? Well, <laughs> regionally competitive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, uh, I know you've said that we can't predict too far into the future, but I'm going to be very cruel. What's the possibility that something really nasty might happen, like another big GFC? Because after all, all I did was print a lot of money that didn't exist to buy bonds that were worthless and push up the US government debt. So maybe that one's going to burst soon. Or the Eurozone's all propped up with unsecured debt. And the Chinese banking system. What's the possibility that something really nasty might happen in the world economy? Oh, inevitable. It was handling over timing. Um, uh, does anyone remember the Asian economic crisis? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And do you know the global financial crisis didn't really affect Asia? It didn't matter if Asia doesn't count, does it? Right? If it happened in America and Europe, it must be global. Um, so, uh, look, we, we, we see these kinds of uh, economic crises on a regular basis. Um, sometimes they're confined uh, to a particular country, Zimbabwe. Uh, sometimes they're confined to a region, Asia. Uh, sometimes they span different regions, North America and the US. Um, Australia had a terrible recession in 91, 92. It had nothing to do with the global economy, really. Uh, so, yeah, look, there will be bad things happen to our economy and to other people's economies. Um, that's inevitable. Uh, there'll be natural disasters in Australia and our trucking partners, which we can't possibly imagine. Um, so, yeah, you know, again, this is why 50-year plans make no sense. And, and bizarrely, why, you know, for all the talk about things like intergenerational reports and worrying about budget deficits, the thing we probably should do most is invest in resilience. Like, if we really actually wanted uh, if we really wanted to look after ourselves, then we would kind of build spare capacity. We would kind of look after each other. We would 
make sure that when bad things happen, you can spread the pain and spread the risk. But we've actually created, I think, a far more atomized society that actually copes worse with shocks. Um, here's a thought experiment. This is a bit weird, but why should that stop me? Um, imagine, you know, so I think Cyclone Katrina decimating, uh, decimating New Orleans. But imagine that wasn't New Orleans. Imagine it was Belgium. Like a disaster that big would pretty much destroy a country. The only reason the US could kind of, you know, cope badly, but kind of recover from a one-off bad luck incident like that, was because the 300 million people of the US could kind of say, well, we might need to post a check to the poor people in, in, in uh, New Orleans. But when a similar disaster uh, hit in Haiti, no <laughs> one to post the check. This is still stuff. So, to some extent, as as things get scarier, as 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 economic or natural disasters become more significant, the more we can work together, the safer we are. Right? Brisbane floods were catastrophic for Brisbane, except luckily for Brisbane, they're part of the Commonwealth of Australia. Remember, we had a flood levy. Yes. Right? Well, there's no Haiti levy. Right? So being part of something bigger is actually a safe thing to do. Yet we're actually pushing each other apart. And I think it's a very, very risky strategy. Ironically, a risky strategy run by people saying we have to worry about the future and we need 50 billion bucks worth of subs because who knows what might happen. Yeah. So this is a question that's more uh, systems level and the natural incompatibility of economics and politics. Uh, so we have I think a, we get on really well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we represented a democracy, we vote for people to re represent us. Yeah. Now according to Adam Smith and many other people, you know, we have an economic system that says you must work in your own self-interest. <laughs> you know, greed is good, all of that sort of thing. So how is it that we can you know, elect people to represent us, but they're meant, meant to work in their own self-interest for economics to work. Yeah, well, great question, um, but I'm going to reject your premise. Um, before Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, which everyone's heard of and no one's read, uh, he, including most economists, of which I might, it's a thuddingly dull book, I assure you. I've read parts of it, but that sucker is not a good read. Um, before Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, he wrote The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And so before Smith wrote a book saying, why don't we just let individuals make their own choices? Before Smith wrote that, Smith wrote a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which was about how a moral person would behave. Okay, so before Smith said, go and rip each other's throats out, knock your socks off, which he never said, he said, maybe you're best to decide what you want for dinner. I shouldn't be telling you what you want for dinner. Smith was just a libertarian, so am I. Um, before Smith said, why don't we leave it all up to the individual, he asked, he wrote a whole book about how would a human, how would a moral human make decisions? And Smith created the thought experiment of the invisible spectator. And the invisible spectator kind of walks around on his shoulder. He was a non-godlike figure who saw everything you saw and knew everything you knew. And he judged you. So if I was going to pinch your wallet because you weren't looking, my invisible spectator would know that I pinch your wallet. And the fact that you weren't looking and I wouldn't get caught, I mean, I wouldn't do it. Not because I couldn't get away with it, but because my immoral person would only ever act in a way that wouldn't offend their, uh, wouldn't offend their, their kind of silent judge. So to be clear, Smith kind of thought that if you could trust humans to be moral, if, it's a pretty big if, if you could trust humans to be moral, to be guided by their, their conscience, by an invisible spectator, by an omnipotent God, it didn't really matter, it wasn't really that religious. Um, if, if you could trust people to make decisions that were moral and right, then why wouldn't you leave individuals to make up their own mind? Keep in mind that Smith was writing at a time where kings told people where to live and where you could work and who could sell land and who couldn't sell land and 
customs duties were handed out to Lord Fauntleroy, and, and he or she got to gouge the, the, the peasants. Right, so Smith was actually a, a libertarian raging against a monarch, saying, stop bossing me around. And in the last 30 years, Smith's been turned into the pinup for selfishness. Um, so, look, economics is just a bunch of ideas. Some of them are good and some of them are crap. But it's just not true uh, that economics is greed is good. Right. Smith never said that. You know, that's why the right is so keen to say he did. Right? Because they just want to justify greed. So why, how insulting. Go and take a guy who said he'd always be moral and use him as the pinup for selfishness. Say the people who cause budget deficits to complain about budget deficits. Say the people who cause unemployment so they can sell you a nuclear waste dump to cure unemployment. So, yeah, economics is just a thing. Democracy is just a thing. But there's nothing in economics that says greed is good and selfishness is great. And we shouldn't elect people who pretend it is. I think it was Hayek who lamented that humans weren't selfish enough and mm. uh, you know, needed the state to step in and make sure that they were, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, mission accomplished. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah the gentleman there. I just wonder if you saw anything positive in the budget, for example, the crackdown on multinationals to yeah. stop um, the tax evasion, shifting the you know, revenues from Australia overseas. And also, what about from the equity point of view regarding superannuation? Yeah, no, there's a couple of good things in the budget. Um, you know, there's actually thousands of decisions, since most of them don't make the speech. Um, so uh, the, the moves on superannuation are very small, but in a very good direction. In 2013, in the lead up to the 2000 election, I debated the head of the Financial Services Council at the National Press Club. In 2013, there was bipartisan consensus that we shouldn't cut super for 10 years. In 2013, Labor was proposing the creation of a non-parliamentary superannuation oversight group to stop politicians doing anything about super. Less than three years later, we have bipartisan consensus that the tax concessions for super are obscene and need to be reined in. But, to be clear, we spend about $35 billion a year on tax concessions for super, and we've now introduced about a billion one thirty-fifth of that in savings at the expense of very rich people. Is that good? Yep. Is it enough? Not even close. But in the context of three years ago, two and a half years ago, both the Labor Party and Liberal Party were committed to no change. It's fantastic. In 2008, when I first took over the Australia Institute, the first thing I worked on was superannuation tax concession reform. Nearly 10 years later, there's a chink in the door. So yeah, hats off to them for that. Um, they're not retrospective, those changes. That's just, that's just good politics from Labor and rich people. Um, they're good changes. Um, the best thing about the budget is what they didn't say, budget emergency. We never had one. We never, ever had one. And we actually have rising unemployment, falling inflation, and we're kind of sitting on the edge of our next downturn. The absolute worst thing the government could do would be to significantly reduce the deficit. So bizarrely, the people who got elected saying budget emergency need to cut the deficit haven't cut the deficit. And to be clear, that's good. Right? It's terrible that they lied about it, but it's great that they're not fixing an imaginary problem because it would actually make our macroeconomy very, very bad. So do you think everyone should get a pension? Um, if we get rid of those $35 billion of um, tax concessions, then one only costs us $25 billion to give everyone a pension. So it's actually cheaper to give everyone a pension and therefore more equitable, and we just get rid of all these bullshit concessions. Yeah, I'll go you one further. The Australian Institute published a paper last year written by a guy called David Ingalls, and I can't remember what it was called which basically said that you could, if you scrapped all tax concessions for superannuation, you could give the age pension to everybody and increase the age pension by 25% and come out 10 billion in front. Okay? 
tax concessions for superannuation are the most outrageous and inequitable way of handing out government support. Effectively, what tax concessions for superannuation do is, well, let's put it another way. Imagine you have $35 billion sitting on the table, and we're gonna, and that's every year, that's the cost of tax concessions. And we're gonna allocate that $35 billion between the community. What tax concessions for super do is post uh, the vast majority of that $35 billion to the richest 20%, give literally nothing to the bottom 40%, Imagine the bottom 40% of the population getting a check for zero every year, saying here's, here's the taxpayer's contribution to your retirement income. You couldn't come up with a sicker, more obscene, worse for women retirement income strategy than tax concessions for super. And yeah, a universal age pension would give some money to rich people who don't deserve it, but compared to the amount of money we're giving them now, it'd be a fire. I think we have time for one more question, and then, um, but people... But no more answers. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> people should feel free to, I think, yeah, stick around afterwards, but... Um, I talk for me. So yeah, there you go. I'm going to call, yeah, Nan Chengchuk. Okay, uh, just talking about uh, something more tactical and media, tell us how to vote. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, that one to six things I talked about before we... Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So, look... We've just changed the way that Senate voting uh, works, and to be honest, I don't think anyone really understands it. Um, I am an economist, but I'm also a, a, a political tragic, and I was once upon a time a preference negotiator. Um, I am a preference whisperer, because <laughs> you've never fucking heard me talk about preferences. The guy who's called a preference whisperer is a preference bellower <laughs> who does nothing but talk about preferences. So I used to be one of those people, and preferences are not well understood by the media, they're not understood by the public, they're very well understood by politicians. Now, what we've done is create an optional preferential system uh, for the Senate. And under this optional preferential system, you can vote. Will you tell me how many boxes should you fill out in the new system? Six, six, six or twelve. Six or twelve. Interesting. Six as many as possible. As possible. Or as many as possible, which is really quite a different answer than six or twelve, isn't it? At least six. At least six or twelve. See, that's quite different than six or twelve, isn't it? See, everyone is confused. So, under the new system, if you put a one above the line for a party, a one, and walk away, it's a valid vote. It'll count. It'll count. Forget what they tell you about one to six. I've read the act many times. A one will count. It's a valid vote. But if the person you vote for doesn't get elected, it's worthless. All right? So if you vote one, the sustainable population party, and walk away, it's a valid vote. And in South Australia, Wasted vote. You're not going to win. You're being encouraged to vote to six. You could vote sustainable population, animal justice, uh, fishing party, shooting party, in, in South Australia, national party. You could vote for six parties, none of whom get elected. You've just wasted your vote. There's an actually with optional preferential, your options are complete. You can vote all the way from one to the bottom of the ticket, which is absolutely what I'd encourage you to do. Because if you don't, there's a very real risk your vote will be completely wasted. It's not called wasted, it's called exhausted. With optional preferential voting, if none of the people you preferred are in the hunt, then you've effectively voted for none. And not many people know this. And telling people they have to vote one to six is both wrong, because the law will count if it's just a one, and unhelpful, because you probably should vote to 20. And you'll have to ask the Greens and the Liberal Party why they came up with that. But the consequence is, at this election, there will be an enormous amount of exhausted votes. And I would call them wasted votes.
and that is people who showed up on polling day and put a one next to their first preference, and maybe they put a two, three, four, five, six. But if you haven't picked one of the people who were in the hunt, you've elected nobody. Whereas in the olden days, when you just voted one, the party then lodged effectively a compulsory voting ticket on your behalf that went all the way from the top of the ticket to the bottom of the ticket. And you might not have liked that happy shield, but there was never a scenario in which you voted one for a party that your vote wasn't crucial at the end when there were two candidates left. All right, so imagine you voted uh, you know, one population, two fishing, three national, four sex, uh, five fast train, uh, six animal equity. And you didn't ever express a preference for Labor, Liberal or Green, then at the end of the race, when there's a Green sitting there and a Liberal sitting there, and they're chugging up to see who's going to win, if you didn't put Green or Liberal on your optional ticket, it's in the bin. It's fine, it's a democracy. We can do anything we want. But the consequences of moving to optional preferential voting are if your options were to vote for people who didn't win, you won't have a say when it counts. Now, you think this is hypothetical. In 2001, Al Gore versus George Bush, Anyone remember by how many votes he lost in Florida and lost the presidency? 500 votes. You know how many people voted for Ralph Nader in Florida that year? 50,000. In the US, they don't have preferential voting. So you have to choose. Al Gore gets all of your vote. Ralph Nader gets all of your vote. Or George W. Bush got all of your vote. So the 50,000 people who went Ralph Nader didn't get to go to Al Gore, and Al Gore lost to George Bush by 500 votes in Florida. Preferential voting is great. We've now moved to optional preferential voting. Too late. That's what we've got. But if you don't express all of the preferences all the way to the bottom of the ticket, and you won't have a say at the bottom of the ticket. So you're saying we should go all the way across at least? At the I would. Yeah. Well, maybe, you know, that's, that's my view. Because I actually think not having a say at the end really matters. Because it's a democracy. That's now up to you. <laughs> so if you don't care whether it's Labour or Liberal at the end, if you don't care if it's Liberal or Green at the end, then don't vote all the way to the end. But if you do care, then vote all the way to the end. Oh, sorry, before you vote, can you please tell us about your truth on negative gearing? <laughs> I don't think I'm allowed yeah. to. Do you want to, I'm sure you can yeah, chat to Rich about that after the vote. I've got a really good question too. Sorry we're running out of time. Um, I'm going to pass over to Mark. Let's have a if, you're, if you're willing to ply Rich with some beer, <laughs> after, after this we've, we've moved on from our official uh, sort of designated speaking time. There are dinner reservations after that have to be met. But um, <clears throat> uh, look, I'd like to thank uh, Richard for coming out tonight, and uh, I'd like to thank Tom. Would anyone like to give him a round of And uh, I'd also especially like to thank Ms. Stephanie and Declan, who did a lot of the organising here tonight, and uh, probably wouldn't have happened without her. So, good one more. So, thank you for having me. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really great. Let's see if you've been here. Look, yeah, buy Richard a beer, uh, ask a question about negative gearing. Uh, I would really like to hear about that as well. Um, yeah, look, thank you very much. Um, just quickly, um, so thank you, uh, Jacqueline, uh, invited me to do this a while ago. And um, yeah, I had a great day. I, uh, I spoke at um, uh, a divestment thing uh, in Melbourne uh, at lunchtime and had a very interesting chat with the Vice Chancellor, which I might tell you about over dinner. And um, you know, here, here tonight, what a, what a great crowd! So uh, thank you uh, for inviting me along. Thank you for organising it. Thank you for coming. Um, if you guys are interested in this sort of stuff, check out the Australia Institute or myself on Facebook and Twitter and all the obvious things. And and the kind of premise of everything I was talking about tonight is in a book I wrote recently called The Common Babble, uh, which is about how economics ruin public debate. So. Uh, if you're interested in that, check it out. But really, congratulations to the student union.
know, the only way things get done is when people organise them. So how about a round of applause for each other?